Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Jeff Elman. I'm Dean of Social Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here, and I'm really excited about the talk. You're going to hear a fantastic talk today, so uh, it's going to be a real treat. The idea that computers could play a role in education, in teaching and learning, is not a new one. Uh, Dick Atkinson, many of us know and revere, and his colleague Pat Supis at Stanford in the mid-60s uh, were among the very first to experiment with the use of computers to teach young children in the Palo Alto uh, reading skills and math skills. That was the beginning of what has turned into a very rich and productive area of research and practice, uh, sometimes known as, known as computer-aided instruction, um, intelligent tutoring. It's gone by various names. So that idea is not a new idea. What is new, and I think has taken our breath away, is the extraordinary interest that has really developed in the public, in the academia, among students and would-be students, uh, in the possibilities of the use of online technology. And we're talking about a phenomenon that has really occurred uh, only within the past year. I think there are two things that are driving this. One of them is the realization that this technology offers significant opportunities for improving current instructional practice. Our current instructional practice, the mainstream, in fact, uh, dates back to the Middle Ages, the lecture, uh, when people read books, and has not changed significantly since then. I guess a major innovation is we no longer read from books, we read from PowerPoint. So I think one, one exciting hope is the possibility of improving the, the instruction the other exciting possibility is that the dream of universal higher education may be realized and that it's the dream of opening access to the entire world, to individuals regardless of location or personal circumstance. That, I think, is what is new. Now, we are very far from achieving either of those goals, and I think a very hard-nosed assessment has to recognize that. But the mere fact that these goals are now in center stage in public discussion and have excited so many people, I think itself is remarkable and, and quite inspiring. There can be no doubt, when one tries to figure out why the sea change, that all of this has been galvanized by the dramatic appearance of the so-called MOOCs, the massive open online courses. And of those MOOCs, I think we have to credit Coursera uh, with really taking the lead in, in opening up this discussion. Our speaker, Tonight is Daphne Kohler. Uh, Daphne and her husband, Andrew Eng, were uh, co-founders. Not my husband. He's just a colleague. A colleague? <laughs> I'm happily married to somebody else. <laughs> That's interesting. A colleague, Andrew Eng. Uh, <laughs> we have plans for you. <laughs> co-founded and our co-CEOs of, of Coursera. Um, Daphne herself is uh, a faculty member at Stanford in the Department of Computer Science. She's the Rajiv Matwani uh, professor. She works in an area that's very relevant to online learning, uh, machine learning, probabilistic modeling with a wide range of applications. Uh, she's been enormously productive, and that has led to significant recognition. She's the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, uh, is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, Coursera is clearly something that is she's passionate about, and it is, represents uh, a marriage, real marriage, between <laughs> the research and the, the practice. I want to say, by way of footnote, uh, that at UCSD, we've been engaged in some ongoing discussions uh, with Coursera about the possibility of partnering, and we're, I think we're very close to, uh, to having a partnership. Um, so I will say, if there are any faculty who are interested in this, please, please let me know. Well, as I said, um, we're in for a treat and an exciting talk, so let's get on with it. Please join me in welcoming Daphne. My actual husband would be very upset if... Uh... <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon and for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to this talk. Um, the title of this talk is The Online Revolution, Education for Everyone. I'm going to start and end with Education for Everyone, and the middle part is going to be The Online Revolution. Um, this project, despite the somewhat 
a ridiculous amount of media attention that's got, that it's gotten and therefore tends to distort the sense of time, um, is really about a year old. That is, we started Coursera in January of 2012. And one of the things that really registered with us as we started Coursera a year ago is this incident that drove home the reason for doing this. And it comes back to the point that Jeff was just making about universal access to education. We in the United States are very fortunate, as are many other countries in the developed world, in having education available to us should we choose to use it. We can quibble about costs, we can quibble about quality, but the education is there for us. That's not true for many countries in the world. Um, where there just isn't the capacity there to accommodate the people who want and deserve an education. One such country is South Africa, and in January of 2012, um, an incident happened that really sort of drove that point home. Um, in South Africa, the educational establishment was created in the days of apartheid for the white minority, and as a consequence, there just are not enough positions at the public institutions, the good ones, for the students who could get in if there was only space. Um, in the University of Johannesburg, one of these top-ranked public institutions, um, after the standard admissions process had closed, there was a tiny handful of slots that had not been taken. And so they were going to reopen that for general enrollment, and the night before that, there was a line of people a mile long outside the gates, hoping to be first to get one of those coveted positions. And in the morning when the gates opened, there was a stampede and 20 people were badly injured and one woman died. She was the mother of a son and so you could say that in some sense she literally died trying to give her son a chance at a better life. And I think that that kind of desperate need is really what makes this um, an, an important effort to try and strive towards. Thomas Friedman, who wrote up about this effort in May of 2012, right after we launched in April, put it, I think, better than anyone else could. He said that big breakthroughs are what happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. The desperately necessary is the South African incident the suddenly possible was what happened in the fall of 2011, which is the first of these massive open online classes. So what, in, and what happened there is that Stanford University, in an experiment, decided to open up three fairly advanced classes in computer science, open to anybody around the world for free. And I think people were expecting enrollment of a few thousand people. But within a week or two, each of those classes had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. Now, the largest of these classes, as taught at Stanford, has an enrollment of 400. This is, my, uh, this is called my colleague Andrew's machine learning class. In order for Andrew to reach that same size audience of 100,000, he would have to teach his Stanford class for 250 years. Now, clearly, that is not a feasible way of achieving access. And so what we, need to do is to, what we needed to do was to leverage on the opportunity provided by these MOOCs in order to try and provide an education to so many more people. So this, is, um, this was in the fall of 2011, so about uh, 16 months ago. Um, in the year that has elapsed since we spun this effort out of Stanford to work with multiple top universities, we now have 33 top-ranked universities working with us, maybe soon to be 34. Um, they are providing 215 courses um, there are actually, this slide is not up to date, it's very hard to keep it up to date. It was 2.5 million a few days ago, now getting close to 2.6 million students from every country around the world except for North Korea. So these are some of the universities that are working with us. Um, you can recognize some of the um, top-ranked U.S. institutions like Stanford, Princeton, Penn, Caltech, and many others. There is a couple of UCs here, very uh, proud to have those, UCSF and UC Irvine, um, University of Illinois, University of Virginia, um, as well as eight non-U.S. institutions, one of which, the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, is actually teaching courses in French aimed at uh, educating people in sub-Saharan Africa and Haiti, where there's really not very much education to be had. And so we're very um, proud to have these university partners working with us. We have um, courses at this point, 215, 
that are um, that span the range of disciplines. A lot of people tend to associate online education, certainly at scale education, with STEM disciplines, math, physics. Uh, we're actually very proud of having a much broader range of disciplines that we're able to accommodate. You can see here, this is just a sampling. You're welcome to go on the site and take a look. Introduction to philosophy from Edinburgh, mental health and illness, global challenges, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, medical classes, uh, engineering classes, history, art, music. There is a performance music class, improv jazz from the Berkeley School of Music, um, and really an incredibly broad range of topics that one can use to educate people around the world. Um, it's interesting to think about the impact that this has on the lives of those students who would not normally have access to this kind of education. And I could stand here and tell stories like that for a couple hours, but I won't. I'm just gonna highlight a few examples. So this is the kind of access that, um, uh, from students in various countries around the world. This is Raul, for example, um, who doesn't have access to a computer science education in his home country, but um, took a bunch of the computer science courses that were among the first to launch on the Coursera platform used that as the basis for his Fulbright application, and now is coming to study in the United States. Jolene lives in Pakistan and took the Sociology 101 class from Princeton, and with a fellow student in the class, was inspired by what she learned in the class, founded an NGO, and they're now working together to improve the lives of people in Pakistan. And Achint um, took the gamification class from the Wharton Business School, and it taught him how to become a better entrepreneur. He got a job as a consequence of that and is now competing in an all-India entrepreneurship competition. Now, it's those kinds of stories that you get from students that really make it worthwhile to, to see the kinds of impact that one has on the lives of individual people. This is the kind of access, though, that you expect to hear. This is one that we weren't expecting. This is Daniel. Daniel is a 17-year-old, severely autistic boy. Um, he has a speaking vocabulary of maybe a couple hundred words. He communicates by typing on a specially designed iPad. He was the star student in the University of Pennsylvania Modern and Contemporary American Poetry class. And Daniel tells us via email that not only is this the first meaningful educational experience that he's had after a life of special ed, that also the rigor of these courses combined with the fact that it doesn't overly strain his social uh, skills by having to look people in the eye um, is actually a way for him to diminish the severity of the disease. And that's something that his parents agree. It's something that we've heard from other autistic students in our class. So this is another type of access that I don't think we were expecting. We get emails like this from all sorts of people who, for health reasons, can't have access to an education. There was just last week an email from someone with um, stage four breast cancer who, because of chemotherapy, can't actually leave the house to have any kind of life outside the home, and, and this is a way for her to maintain a contact with something that's engaging and, and takes her out of uh, the day-to-day -day trials that she has to live with. So let's talk a little bit about what these courses look like and, um, and what makes them different from a lot of the open courseware uh, initiatives that had been around previously. So most OCW content, open courseware, is passive. That is, it sits there, you come, you watch it, it's great, and that's the end of it. This is actually an attempt to provide to students in the general public something that looks like the kind of experience that our on-campus students have. So the course begins on a given day. And then every week, there is material that the students are responsible for learning if they're taking the course. And every week, there is homework. And the homework is graded, so students get feedback about whether they're learning or not. And if they don't do well, they know that. And if they don't do well, then they don't pass the course. And you can see the impact of deadlines in the usage graph that you're about to see, where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is users on the site. And you see those blips? Those are deadlines. <laughs> The day before the deadline, everybody logs in to do their homework, just like students on campus. And at the end of the day, there is a credential. It's not a, um, a credit-bearing credential, although I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, but it's a certificate that students have presented successfully to employers, like Achint, who we saw in one of the earlier slides, that has allowed them to get access to a better job. So I'm going to talk now briefly about the three pillars of the student experience on one of these MOOCs. The first is the use of video as a mechanism of instruction. 
which is a way for students to feel like somebody's actually teaching them as opposed to, say, a lot of text-based online learning um, experiences. So let's um, see what the student experience looks like. And I forgot to plug in the sound, so let's hope this works. So this is what the student experience looks like. You're about to see one of the instructors teaching. I hope. Game. And generally, we'll you can start watch at with some five set of speed. players as an accepted uh, starting point. You're being bored. And then we have to decide you can watch um, what, are their subtitles. Strategies, what are the possible actions that each player can take. Um, is, is passive and active enough in of multiple a different languages in order to really capture the details of what's going on in a predator prey relationship? Well, pro probably not. The subtitles are something that we provide, but the translated subtitles are actually crowdsourced by students in the class who want to make the material more accessible to their fellow countrymen who aren't necessarily as proficient in English. Now, one of the things that you can do by breaking away from the constraints of in-classroom teaching is you can get really creative with your teaching, and our instructors do that on a regular basis. So I'm just going to highlight a few examples, and there's many more in, in other courses on the site. So the top left is the University of Illinois um, sustainability class, it was very popular. Um, they shot a bunch of their videos on site in places where sustainability issues are clearly manifest. At the bottom left is, the universe, is Princeton University's introduction to sociology class, where in addition to the weekly content, which is more of this kind of uh, video lecture-based format, he had a weekly discussion section with, via Google Hangouts, you can see that on the screen in front of him, with two Princeton students and six students from all sorts of other countries around the world, presenting their own society's perspective on the sociological question of the week. And, uh, and Mitch Denier, the professor, says that he learned more from teaching this class with this much more global perspective than he learned in 12 years of teaching at Princeton because of the diversity of opinions that was represented in the discussions. At the bottom right, um, there is the Wharton gamification class that we mentioned earlier. Um, that character right in the middle is actually the instructor. <laughs> um, trying to make the class more lively by doing part of it as a computer game character. Um, the other way in which one can break away from the constraints of in-class teaching is that we're no longer subject to room scheduling constraints, which means that instead of being subject to the uh, tyranny of hour and 15 minute blocks, we can now teach the material in the way that makes more sense with the overall granularity of the material. So you can break up the content into eight to 12 minute blocks that correspond to coherent topics. Students can traverse this at their own pace, potentially in different orders. It also allows you to um, add material that is, um, that is more than just the basics. So for example, here is a refresher content that might be important for some students, but not everyone needs it. Or you might have optional material that's of interest to some, but not all students. So this allows us to break away from the one-size-fits-all model of education that we've been forced into by having to teach to 300 people stuck in an auditorium. This allows much more personalization of the curriculum in having people traverse the material that interests them at their own pace in their own time. So that's the video-based component, and in some sense, it's the most visible, but perhaps also the, less, the least interesting part of the user experience. Much more important as a part of the user experience is the constant practice that students have to engage in. So this is based on a whole slew of educational studies, of which I'm only going to mention one. This is a, a, one of a series of papers from this group uh, by Karpika and Blunt, appeared in Science in 2011, that demonstrates, for example, that even simple retrieval practice where a student has to prove or demonstrate that they remember what you told them 15 minutes ago significantly improves learning outcomes compared to, say, a more passive learning um, using the same amount of time. And so we've tried to build in practice, both retrieval practice and deeper practice, into the student experience. So first of all, let's show what that looks like in terms of simple retrieval practice. So this is what um, part of the in-lecture interaction looks like. So even those 12-minute videos are not units where you sit there passively. So you can see here, oops, what happened? these four things, prospect theory, hyperbolic discounting, status quo so bias, So when the video bias, hits the yellow notch, well it's so going all to well pause. Documented deviations from rational behavior. And the student gets asked a question, and they're supposed to answer that question. And in this case, they got it wrong. So they can go back and rewatch the video or just resubmit. And now, in this case, they got it right. And there's an option explanation, and they can continue watching the lecture. Now, 
this is the kind of question that we as instructors might ask of our students in an in-class setting. But unless you're one of the few instructors that uses clickers, what typically happens when we do this is that 80% of the students are still scribbling the last thing we said. The ones on the back row are all on Facebook. And then there's the smarty pants in the front row who basically blurts out the answer before pretty much anyone else in the class has even realized that a question had been asked. At this point, the class moves on, and most of the class never engage with the question. Here, every single student has to engage with the question. Now, this is not where the deep learning happens, because these are little baby questions, retention questions. The much deeper learning happens in the graded homework that happens every week. So I, I'm sure that some of you are sitting here scratching your head saying, OK, so you have 100,000 students. That would be, oh, 5,000 teaching assistants. So Stanford really paid for that? Um, so the answer is no, um, Stanford didn't pay for that. And so we, we had to come up with other solutions for grading at scale, and there's two main strategies that we adopted. The first is getting a computer to do the work for you. And the nice thing is that somehow is that now computers can grade a fairly broad range of work, not everything, but a reasonable set of things. So in addition to the good old multiple choice, um, there's short answers that you saw in the video a moment ago. Uh, there's the ability to grade uh, mathematical expressions, including with a fair degree of flexibility. So for example, the computer knows how to recognize semantic equivalence between different formulas that are written very, very differently, and thereby allows the instructor to just state what the right answer is without having to consider all of the numerous variations that a student might come up with that are still correct. In addition to those, there is the ability to grade um, anything that has a structured form as an output, whether it be a computer program, a computer model of, say, a physical or a um, or financial system, for example, uh, as well as, for example, an Excel spreadsheet that might be for uh, data analysis or a marketing model or whatever. As long as the output has a pre-specified form, it can be graded by a computer. Now, that's all very well and good, but when we finished putting all this together and we were going around to our initial batch of university partners telling them about this, uh, the humanities faculty came and said, well, that's all very well and good, but we don't use computer programs very much and not Excel spreadsheets very much either, and math doesn't really come into it, so does that leave us with multiple choice? And when we tried to argue that multiple choice was underrated, they didn't really resonate with that particular view. And so in order to address the need to teach courses across the range of disciplines, we put together, oops, sorry, I keep forgetting about this. OK, I'm sorry. I'm going to come back to this point in just a second. Um, this is a new slide, which is why I forget about it. Um, this is a slide that demonstrates, I'm coming back to computer programs for just a moment, because it illustrates an important point. Um, so this is um, a student that's supposed to color correct the image in the right hand side of the browser. Um, they don't, it didn't work out the first time. They tried again, this time it worked. Now this notion of trying and trying again is actually an essential part of the student experience, which is why I wanted to talk about these slides. The students, by virtue of being given instant feedback about the assignments, which is something you can do when the computer is grading, are naturally led to consider the assignment as a game. So when you can compare that to the kind of experience that you have when doing on-campus teaching, you, students submit the work. Typically, they get the work back after a couple weeks. By that point, the class has moved on. So even if the student didn't do so well, they don't have the motivation to come back and try and fix it. Here, because of the immediate feedback, everybody says, I can do better than 70 out of 100. And so they try. And you can see here, for example, the blue bars are the, is the distribution of initial grades for one of our assignments, and the green bars is the distribution of the final grades after the students have had an opportunity to resubmit. So you can see that the students are incentivized to try to do better and better, and most students get a close to perfect score. Now, you might question whether this actually helps. Clearly, it gives them a better score on this assignment, but does it actually teach them any better? So we just recently did an analysis on this and demonstrated that if you correct for current performance on, say, problem set one, students who engage in what's called this mastery learning loop actually do better on problem set two than the ones who don't. So this actually does improve performance, not just by improving their score on this assignment, but also in downstream assignments. Okay. So now going back to how to deal with more critical thinking open-ended style work, which is the 
um, what I had before this digression on mastery. Uh, we use peer grading as a, uh, as a solution. This is based on a work that was actually done at UCLA called Calibrated Peer Review, but with elements from crowdsourcing thrown in. And it allows students to provide meaningful, critical feedback on the work of other students in the class. The way in which that's done is the instructor carefully constructs a grading rubric that defines the criteria that they're looking for and what makes for a good, moderate, or bad answer relative to each of those criteria. Students are trained in the use of that rubric and then are um, allowed to go grade the work of others in the class. Each student gets feedback from five other students and their scores are aggregated to give a final score for the assignment. And it turns out that you can use this to grade a whole range of different types of work. Here, for example, in, in the pan genomics class, students are grading, students are supposed to be doing a critique of a scientific paper. What's wrong with it? Does, are the methods correct? Are the results interesting? And so on. And other students are critiquing the critique. So this is really critical thinking as, as it was intended to be. Now, you might ask whether peer grading is at all reliable, and it turns out that if the grading rubric is well constructed, the answer is yes. So this is in the Princeton sociology class, and the grading rubric there was very well thought out, and you can see on the x-axis there's a teacher score, on the y-axis there's the peer score, and there's a very nice strong correlation between them, showing that peer grading can actually provide meaningful feedback to students. And this is for a bunch of essay questions on the final exam, which I can tell you I looked at that final exam. It's hard. I don't know how to do those questions. I'm going to skip past this. Um, the range of exercises that one can do here is actually quite amazing. So this is from the um, Wharton uh, School design class. And the students, throughout the duration of the course, had to provide first a concept, then a prototype, and finally an actual artifact. And what you see here is some of the artifacts that got a final uh, a score of a perfect final score in the class. Now, the point is, each of the stages was graded using peer grading. So, since there were about eight stages and you got five pieces of feedback at each stage, by the end of, your, of the course, 40 people had given you comments about your design at different stages, which really enriches the students' experience dramatically. And some of these are really very creative. You can see there's a laptop table with like a vent and a place to store cables. There is a, um, a place for charging things that sticks to the wall in case there's no table next to the power supply, um, or a space-efficient desk and shelf unit that folds into the wall for apartments that don't have a lot of space. Now, I am telling you the truth when I tell you that I picked those based purely on the ones that I thought were cool and easy to demonstrate visually from among the successful final projects in the class, only to notice later that they came from three different continents. So you can see there's one from India, one from Spain, and one from the Philippines. So it's kind of um, satisfying. Now, the other thing that happens is that the peer grading also generates a community among the students in the class. So in the uh, pen poetry class that I mentioned earlier in the context of Daniel's story, uh, the instructor had every essay that the students wrote posted on the discussion forum together with the peer grading comments. And other students could then read the essay and the comments and provide additional feedback. And you can see this is one example of an essay that was written on a, on a I think, a poem by Ezra Pound that had 60 different students posting on it and 872 distinct students, uh, 872 different views. Which brings us naturally to the final pillar of the student experience, which is that of community. So this is, as I said, a worldwide community, people from everywhere in the world. Uh, and they communicate with each other um, in a way that is, attempt, is our attempt to help them substitute for the one thing that really just doesn't scale, which is the interaction with the instructor. So since the, since the instructor can't interact with tens of thousands of students, we're substituting for that by having students teach each other, a form of peer teaching. And the way in which this happens is, first of all, by having the discussion forum uh, be a place where students can post questions and other students can answer those questions. And we find that students are actually really good at responding to questions of their peers. And it provides a valuable experience both to the students who get their questions answered, but also the students answering questions learn a tremendous amount from basically doing some teaching. 
And students tell us that in many ways this is a more interactive experience than many on-campus classes where they sit in class, they listen to the instructor, then they go off to their dorm room and they never really interact very much with other students in the class. Now this is a place where somewhat counterintuitively perhaps having a larger class is actually a better experience for the students than having a smaller class. So what you see here on the x-axis is the number of active users in the class and on the y-axis is the response time to questions asked on the forum, the median response time in that class. And you can see that the bigger the class, the faster the questions are answered, which obviously makes sense. There's more people around to answer them. Qualitatively, the answers tend to be better also because there's also more experts around to answer the questions. And so this is, a play, this is one of the reasons why we actually wait until enrollment builds up to a certain level before launching in class because we want to make sure that the classes are large enough, whereas typically one aims in college environments for classes that are small enough. Uh, the other place where community happens is just emerged organically without any kind of intervention from us. Students just self-assembled into study groups. Many of these study groups are physical, so you can see a sampling of the meetup points that Coursera students have around the world in about 1,800 meetups in over 1,500 different cities. And they meet up once a week to discuss the material and help each other and, and talk to each other and, and deal with the challenges of this material. In addition to the physical meetups, there's also virtual communities. Some of them are structured along um, societal boundaries, so for example, Russian-speaking students. But some of them are actually explicitly multicultural. And what we hear from students is that they end up talking to people from cultures that not only have they never spoken with, but in some cases are even actual enemies of some kind or another. And this helps break down some of the, some of the barriers between cultures. So now let's take a step up from this and talk about some of the implications. So first of all is the data that's collected in these classes because we collect every single event. Um, every time a student pauses the video, rewinds, moves to 1.5 speed because the instructor is being boring, um, submits a question, resubmits a question, looks at the form, asks a question on the form, everything is recorded which means that the level of detail that we have about students' trajectory through the course is unprecedented. When you think about the kind of visibility that we typically have about students in our on-campus classes, what do we know about them? We might really take a look mostly at their performance on the final exam and bemoan the fact that there's all sorts of stuff that we thought we were teaching them and they don't already know, right? At least from my personal experience. Here, we have much bigger visibility into what students are actually learning. The other aspect of this is the scale because we now can look at these data in the context of 20,000 students as opposed to in the case of 20 students, and that gives us statistical power to ask certain kinds of questions. So let's talk about some of the questions that one can answer. Some of these happen at a local level in the context of a particular course. So for example, here is a distribution of wrong answers in one of Andrew's machine learning exercises that happen to be pairs of numbers so you can graph them on a grid. Each little cross is a one-off wrong answer where students found a particularly creative way to be wrong. The big crosses are ones where many students converge on the same wrong answer. So for example, the one at the top left is where 2,000 students in the class came up with the exact same wrong answer in this infinite space. And when two students in a class of 100 come up with the same wrong answer, you would never notice. But when 2,000 students do that, it's hard to miss. And so Andrew and his TAs walked in, looked at, the, um, looked at what was going on, understood the basis for the misconception, which means that now students that fall into that bucket, the computer recognizes it and tells them, not only did you get it wrong, but here's some ways you might want to think about in order to correct the misunderstanding that you have. So personalizing the experience to the specific mistake that they made. You could also ask questions at a much broader level. So for example, uh, one of the questions that you might want to answer is whether having the instructor's face showing in the video is a good thing or a bad thing. And I can point you to papers that say that it's a good thing because it humanizes learning experience. And I can point you to a good number of papers that say that it distracts from the focus on the content that's, that is on the slides. 
And so we can try it now. So the mechanism that we're using here is what's called A-B testing. It's Silicon Valley jargon for case control. And what it means, except much faster turnaround, when you log into Google on, a, on any given day, there is usually about a 10% chance that you will have a different user experience than the remaining 90% of the population. And they track very carefully whatever outcome they care about, whether it's click through on the top 10 hits or whatever, and they see which population does better. And if the 10% is doing better than 90%, the entire site switches over to that experience in a matter of, of days, as opposed to in a matter of months or years. Well, now we can do the same for pedagogy. We can test what works and what doesn't. So here, for example, is the result of this particular test. And we actually had to stop this test because the students who were in the B group who didn't see the instructor's face complained bitterly that they were having a hard time focusing on the videos and that they weren't as engaging. So we learned something. Here's another thing we learned that was maybe even more surprising. When you send students an email saying, there's a deadline coming up, you should log in and do your homework, you would think that would increase student retention, right? Well, it turns out that the answer is more nuanced than that. So we sent students an email, and the email had three different components in it. One was what you've done. One was like what you've completed in the course. The second is what was up next. You can see the deadline right there in the middle. And the third is an infographic that shows um, how far along in the course you are. So here's the interesting thing. Of the, three, of the eight different combinations of these three different factors, only one actually increases retention. The one that has all three of these pieces. That is, if you just tell people that there is a deadline, for example, that's the worst one. They think they're being nagged and they're less retained. So the only one that actually works is this one. So, you know, that's another thing that you could try out and learn. Now, of course, you might try it out in different courses. It might work differently. But these are the kinds of experiments that you can now conduct. Okay. The last topic I'd like to talk about is the certificate at the end, which we briefly alluded to at the beginning. So what kind of credentials do students get from this? This started out in, with this. This is the statement of accomplishment that Stanford let us provide for the fall quarter classes in 2011. So you can see that this is signed by the instructor. There is no mention of Stanford anywhere else. And in fact, the only mention of Stanford is where it says it does not confer Stanford credit. Uh, and it says that the student identity is not verified. So that was the version 0.1 of certification. Nevertheless, students got benefit from it. We know of students who got jobs. We know even of students who got academic credit for it at their home institutions, specifically the University of Helsinki, for example, uh, on a regular basis, gave credit to Coursera students who had completed these courses. This is generation 1.0 of credentials. Uh, this is what we call the signature track, and it, it's an attempt to reduce that legal boilerplate down at the bottom of the student's identity has not been verified. Here, the student's identity is actually verified using a photo ID that's compared by a human to their webcam photo. They create a biometric profile that consists of their photo as well as a keystroke pattern. And then every time they submit work, the system verifies that it's them at the keyboard submitting the work as opposed to somebody else, which allows us to give a verified certificate where the identity has been verified. And we can assert that the student had signed their work every time they submitted it. Now, can they cheat? Yes, of course they can cheat, just like students can cheat on their homework when, when we assign them work at home in our college classes. We launched this about three weeks ago. Students seem to like it. It's opt-in only, I forgot to say. So this has a charge, but only for students who want it. That is, the access to the class and the statements of accomplishment are still free. So this is purely an add-on for students who feel like they benefit from it. Nevertheless, some students benefit from it, but don't have the money to pay for $49. For example, if you live in Africa or in Bangladesh. And so as part of that, we put in a financial aid um, application process so the students who feel like they really need the certificate but can't afford to pay for it just write up an application, a paragraph of why they need it, and a paragraph of why they can't afford it, and they get it for free. It's part of the commitment to equal access. The final piece of this is something that's in play right now, which actually talks about the actual college credit. The previous one is mostly for continuing ed students um, who don't really ever want to go back to school and get a degree. But what if you do want a degree? 
So in November, we announced an agreement with the American Council for Education. It's, a, it's an umbrella organization of US institutions, very well established, 100 years old. They administer the GEDs and a variety of other things. And one of the things that they do is the ACE credit program, which is a, a mechanism by which they assess credit equivalency of courses that are taught in non-traditional settings, military, government, or industry. And they say, yep, that course is worth three units of a general electives in electrical engineering, for example. And what they've, just, what they've agreed to do is to take initially a handful of our MOOCs, assess them for credit equivalency, and if they think that the rigor and academic standards are enough, then these courses will be eligible for transfer credit into academic institutions. So to clarify what that means, it's not the institution that created the course that's giving the credit, and it's certainly not Coursera that's giving the credit, because we don't give credit, we're not a university. It's the institution where the student ultimately enrolls as a matriculated student that's giving the credit for prior learning. And so you kind of circumvent the question of who gives credit for these things. And the assessment is about to conclude, and let, we say, let me say that it seems to be going really well. And so this will be a way for students to take these MOOCs as independent learners and walk into a college with credit under their belt that they can use towards a degree, um, which we hope will help increase uh, both college attendance rates, but also equally importantly, college completion rates. Finally, a different way in which students can get credit for Coursera courses goes in a totally different direction. I'll come back to that in a moment. This is. Um, a way in which Coursera content, and in general, uh, you know, uh, MOOCs, can be used to break us away from that. Where instead of that, you can move to a blended learning format where students learn content online and then use that content when they walk into class to actually have more of an active learning discussion and engage with each other and with the instructor in much more of a dialogue. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And then, of course, the institution that uses these courses is the one that's providing the credit. Which brings me to a, the final piece of this, which is improving learning outcomes. And there's two distinct ways in which learning outcomes can be improved, I think, using this kind of um, technology-enabled learning. The first is in the online realm, and the second in the physical realm. The online realm goes back at least 30 years, um, for example, to this paper by renowned educational researcher Benjamin Bloom, who in 1984 wrote a paper called The Two Sigma Problem. And Bloom studied three populations, the first and the achievement score distribution of those populations. The first is the lecture-based class that uh, where it wasn't even a very large lecture. I think it had 30 to 40 students in the class. And this is a distribution of achievement scores. The second is the distribution of mastery learning. Uh, it is a distribution of, of, of students who were taught in a, in a lecture-based class but in a mastery learning format, which means that they couldn't move on to the next topic before demonstrating competence in the previous one. And you can see that that gives a full standard deviation, or sigma as it's called in statistics, improvement in the distribution of achievement scores. The final population that Bloom studied are those students fortunate enough to have access to an individual human tutor, and that gives rise to yet another uh, standard deviation improvement in the performance scores. So to understand what two sigma uh, improvement means, um, Benjamin Bloom makes the following point. He says that if you pick the midpoint of the distribution of the blue curve as a performance threshold, half are going to be above and half are going to be below because it's the median. If you pick that same performance threshold and apply it to the green curve, 98% are going to be above that threshold. So effectively, 98% of our students are now suddenly above what used to be the average. Now, that would be a huge improvement in learning outcomes, clearly, but uh, hence the two sigma problem. Because as Bloom correctly points out, as a society, unfortunately, we cannot afford to provide a human tutor for every student. But maybe now we can afford to provide every student with an internet connection and a tablet, or at least a smartphone. And if we can do that, which is not trivial either, but if we can, then the question is, can we now use technology-enabled learning to move us from the blue curve to the red curve and ultimately to the green curve? The good news is that the red curve is well within reach, because the nice thing about computers is that they don't mind showing you the same video five times without becoming judgmental. <laughs> The green curve, and they also don't mind grading the same work three times until you get it, where a human TA would really rebel, right? I would. Um, so that's easy, 
I think. The green curve obviously is harder. Um, we cannot currently provide, we don't currently have technology that can really personalize the learning experience to students in the same way that a human tutor can. I think we can make forays into that. We already talked a little bit about learning at your own pace. That's certainly a big level of personalization. Talked about providing some amount of personalized uh, feedback to students by using big data. But clearly, there's a long ways to go before we can get to the green curve. But I think that's a fascinating research question for us to tackle. The second place where learning outcomes can be improved is in physical classrooms. And one of my favorite quotes here, one that's typically attributed to Mark Twain incorrectly, um, is that college is a place where professors' lecture notes go straight to the students' lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. I don't think that's an unfair damnation of your typical large lecture class, where students basically sit there scribbling passively whatever it is that the instructor is saying. So the question is, what can we do to be better than that? And I think we can go back and turn to Plutarch for inspiration, who said that the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. And so how do you ignite students' minds? Smarter people than myself have been studying the problem for a while. Here, for example, is, is, is another science paper, this time from Carl Wyman's group. Uh, Carl Wyman has been experimenting for years with active learning in the classroom and developing pedagogy for how to engage students much more in physical classroom settings. And in this particular paper, uh, which is one of many, uh, Wyman studied a large physics class, 270 students, and compared one of those classes that had an active learning component to one that used the traditional lecture-based format. And he shows that in every single metric, attendance, engagement, and learning, the active learning population performs considerably better than a lecture-based classroom. And if you can do this in a class of 270, I think you can do this in pretty much all classes, and that this gives rise to a much better learning outcome. So to summarize, and this is a really interesting analysis that was done by Christian Turwish, who is one of our instructors. He taught an operations research class. And he did a, his final lecture in the class was a case study on Coursera. And he talked about how one of the things that was going on here is that MOOCs move the Pareto optimal frontier of education from where it currently is, which is on the left, to a new frontier that's on the right. And that you can use this new frontier in all sorts of different ways. You can keep student learning about where it is right now, at least in large lecture classes, and move to the right to decrease costs to the point that we can provide an education that's pretty good to people around the world at what is effectively a zero marginal cost per student. Or for those students who are, for example, at our own institutions, we can keep faculty productivity um, and costs the same and increase student learning using some of the methodologies that we discussed. Or you can go on other points along this frontier and basically trade off student learning for costs in a variety of different ways. Which brings me to the end of the talk in the last couple slides, which, back, which is back to education for everyone. It's interesting to understand education for everyone in the context of the demographics of the current population that we have. So here is on the right, you can see the distribution of students that are currently on the Coursera platform. And admittedly, as we start offering more four credit offerings, this might change. But right now, about 80% of our population have either degrees or advanced degrees and are there not because they want to get another degree, but because they want to continue remaining educated. And I think this is an indication of the fact that we're now living in a world that's changing so fast that what we learned in college 15 or 20 years ago is no longer enough to keep us as productive members of society. And that this availability of high quality educational resources really opens the door to lifelong learning that enables people to stay current or maybe even to change their careers or their lives altogether by learning something new. The other interesting breakdown of the student demographics is where they come from. So third, about a third of our students indeed are in North America, um, slightly less than 30% are in Europe, but the rest are in continents where access to education is currently somewhat limited. And we can see that we have about 9% of our students from South America, 3.5% from Africa. And we can now provide these students with access to education. What are the implications of providing free access to higher education and turning higher education to something that is a basic right as opposed to a privilege? First of all, it's opening the door to just equality. Because the thing that really enables um, people to get ahead in life is education. 
Uh, when I, in September, the United Nations launched their Education First initiative, which is intended to bring all 61 million children that are currently not in schools um, into at least a primary and a secondary education, and ultimately tertiary as well. And what they were talking about at the launch is that when you go to these villages in Africa, um, these are uh, not even villages, some of those are re refugee camps, and you ask people what they most want, um, they don't say more food, and they don't say better shelter. What they say is a better education for their children because they know that that is the only way for their children to permanently get ahead in life. The other um, aspect of this is the serendipity aspect, which is we don't know where the next Albert Einstein is currently living. There is this very famous story of a mathematician called Ramanujan who emerged somehow from a village in India back in the 19th century and without having any formal training, came up with some of the greatest inventions in mathematics. So if we provide access to education to everyone around the world, maybe this Albert Einstein that's living in Africa will come up with the next great invention that makes the world a better place for everyone. Thank you very much.